Amen, amen, amen. Guys, there is so much life around here. It is amazing. It is awesome to see. If you're a guest, a visitor with us this morning, and you are wondering what you are sensing here this morning, that is the Spirit of God moving in so many different ways. It's what, it's what King Jesus produces in us. We call it eternal life and salvation, and Noah just gave witness and testimony to that, okay? Amen? Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. We've been walking through, all the way since last fall, the book of Acts. And uh, last week we got to a very key important moment. And that was the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. So uh, let me quickly quickly give you kind of the movement of what's been taking place in Acts as we pick up. Uh, Paul's story. Okay, we're first introduced to Paul. By the way, uh, in the first part of Acts, he is referred to as Saul, and then later on, Paul. Uh, Saul is his Hebrew name, and Paul is his Greek name. They they seem to be used interchangeably. Okay, <clears throat> for the most part, I'm probably just going to call him Paul because that's what I'm used to calling him. But I'll probably go back and forth. All right, but. We're first introduced to Paul at the stoning of Stephen in Jerusalem. Up until that point, uh, the, the gospel had pretty much been contained in a bubble in Jerusalem, okay? But through persecution of the early church, through the Jewish leaders rejecting the gospel, the gospel is forced out. That bubble burst, and the early church begins to flee. And then we saw Philip, go into Samaria. And this incredible thing, that was the Samaritans received the gospel. A revival broke out. Thousands are coming to faith in Jesus there in Samaria. And then in the midst of that, God calls Philip away to one, to meet one, an Ethiopian eunuch, a eunuch who was the defective, the inadequate, who is made whole in Jesus. And then last week we saw the conversion of another one, this time on the opposite end of the spectrum from the eunuch, because Paul represents the self-righteous, a smug superiority that tries to earn God's favor by creating self-made standards that others always fall short of and we excel, and yet The self-righteous won't even recognize God himself when he shows up. Guys, Paul was so self-righteous, he hunted the church. And the question is, is the gospel even for him? And last week we found that even the sin of self-righteousness, even the sin of wanting to put others down and exalt over them, even the sin of trying to earn your salvation, the gospel is for you and for me. The answer is yes. Jesus was humble enough to actually hunt the hunter and give him eternal life. So now this morning, we're gonna pick up Saul, Paul's story, And we're going to find this next season of his life is going to be one that's filled of refinement, refinement. So listen as I read Acts chapter 9, second half of verse 19 through 22. It says, now for several days, he, that's Paul, was with the disciples who were at Damascus and immediately He began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the son of God. And all those who were hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we pray with 
open hands, inviting, seeking that your spirit would convict us, would teach us, would refine us through even the fire and trials of life. Father, we want you to be proud of us. We want to walk worthy of you. And so we ask you to mold us, shape us into the image of your son. We invite you to steer our lives wherever you wish. We surrender to you, King Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. So Paul comes into Damascus, a high-ranking official with special orders from the Sanhedrin. Okay, he's a top 70 leader in all of Israel, highly educated, Gamaliel's protege, and he has been on the attack an overwhelming opponent of the church with his razor-sharp mind. He is as ferocious as a pit bull. Suddenly, miraculously, he is changed. He came hunting the church. I mean, you have to know and understand, the whole Jewish and Christian community knows he is there in Damascus. And two weeks later, he's in the synagogues arguing for Jesus. He is the Christ. Telling and retelling how the resurrected Lord appeared to him on the road. All right, maybe he's quoting Psalm 16 or Isaiah 53. Some of those well-known passages of the early church. And he's saying, guys, it's right there. It's right there. The Messiah had to suffer and to die. But God raised him from the dead and I've seen him. Friends, I came to Damascus to, to destroy, to put to death Christians. And now I'm telling you, Jesus is alive. And I've seen him. He is the son of God. Verse 22 tells us that Paul is confounding all. And verse 25 tells us that in this short ministry moment that Paul has made disciples, presumably some of the entourage that he came into town with. And he is winning others to Christ. And he certainly is winning every argument. All right, he is a force of nature. You remember the passion and determination that Paul lived with? Now he is for Jesus, for the kingdom of God. And with it, he has the promise from Jesus from Jesus himself. He is my chosen instrument to go before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Watch out. The devil's not going to know what hit him. Verse 23 of chapter 9. When many days had elapsed. Now it's important here for me to piece together a probable timeline in Paul's life. Okay, we don't know the exact timeline, the exact amounts of time, but we know general time frames, okay? After Paul's conversion, he immediately gives testimony in Damascus, and ministry exploded. Remember, he's a very high rank leader. He's the highest ranking leader who's now in Damascus and he's going from synagogue to synagogue and every time he comes in, right, he has the floor. But that initial ministry period was actually short, maybe three to five months. When Paul tells us in Galatians chapter one that he went away to Arabia 
for a period of like two years, did the Spirit simply call him away? Or were there circumstances that caused him to flee? Maybe after three months, word got back to Jerusalem and and they came looking for him. Either way, we don't know. But we know that God's sovereign hand was moving. When Paul tells us about this period of his life in Galatians chapter 1, he gives us the idea that God intentionally pulled him aside for an extended period of solitude so that he could understand the gospel. You remember Jesus' statement in John chapter 5, verse 39, when he's talking to the Jewish leaders? He's like, you search the scriptures because you you think that in them you, you have eternal life, but it is these that testify about me. You see, Paul was a Pharisee, and he had spent his whole life searching the scriptures, and yet he did not recognize the Son of God when he showed up. In fact, Paul hated the gospel. How could he have been so far off? And so the Spirit of God calls Paul aside for years of solitude to read and to reread the entire Bible, right? He had the Old Testament. Now with fresh eyes to understand God's gracious provision. He is meeting God daily in the word, having his mind transformed and begins to see that all along the whole Bible has been pointing to the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, after this, say, two-year period of time, Galatians tells us that he returned to Damascus. Now, this is where Luke picks up in verse 23 when he says, when many days had elapsed. So now, upon this return, okay, after two years, put yourself in Paul's shoes. Because for a few short months, there was this glorious, exciting ministry. And then he's pulled aside for like two years. And you think, oh, well, but now his theology is sharp. And he comes back to Damascus. I imagine that he is full of hope and plans for ministry, right? A racehorse that is ready to run. You see, no one dreams about trials and persecution. That part never makes it in our plans. Paul returns with a sparkle in his eye. But again, it's only for a very short period of time back in Damascus that Jewish leaders had completely turned against him and are plotting to kill him. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that the governor of Damascus had received orders from King Artius to capture Paul. And so they have stationed soldiers at every entrance and exit to the city. All the city gates are surrounded and they are looking for him. He is a wanted, hunted man. Verse 24, and they were watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But wouldn't you know in God's providence that a Christian family lives along the city wall and is able to provide a way of escape for the now fugitive. Verse 25, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. Guys, this is incredibly humiliating to Paul. Incredibly humiliating. A once distinguished, revered teacher and leader now leaves under the cover of darkness lowered in a basket. As Paul 
returns down the same road he came into Damascus. He leaves a very different man. But do not picture in your mind's eye Paul at the end of his life who contently gives his life to Nero. Paul is in early formation. He wrestles deep inside as his pride takes vicious blows. It will be more than a decade later until he can look back on these very events and and write, if I must boast, I will boast in the things that show my weaknesses. 2 Corinthians 11.30. Damascus did not go according to plan. But that's okay because now Paul is returning to Jerusalem and he has high hopes of connecting with the church there as well as witnessing to the hundreds of friends and loved ones from his former life. It might be close to six years since Stephen's death when Paul began ravaging the church in Jerusalem and Judea. I imagine as he goes back to Jerusalem, he has much to say to the church leaders and to specific families. Excitement to share uh, about his conversion, along with apologies and tears over the hurt that he's caused. Verse 26, when he came to Jerusalem, He was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Paul's in an incredibly lonely place. As we will see in a moment, things do not go particularly well in his Jewish circles of former life. And when the church church rejects him out of fear, He has no identity, no place where he fits in. Verse 27, but Barnabas, but Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and how he had talked to him and how how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. However many weeks or months went by with, with Paul isolated, having no identity, no community to connect with, he's back in Jerusalem, but Barnabas, who saw the best in everyone, But Barnabas believed that it was just like Jesus to save the very one who was ravaging them. But Barnabas took a chance, came out and met with Paul, heard his whole story and then brought him back by the hand and became his spokesman to the whole group. Trust him on account of me. Verse 28, and Paul was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of Jesus. And for another short stint, Paul is dreaming about Christ kingdom making rapid advancements, right? How many old time friends did he sit down to dinner with and tell them about his newfound Jesus? Did he say, I was blind, but now I see. I imagine he popped by on former teachers, taught in synagogues, engaged in open debate, But after a short period of time, Jerusalem has had enough of Paul. And again, there are plots brewing to put him to death. Later in Acts 22, when when Paul is recounting this portion of his story, 
he talks about that he was in the temple one day praying. When Jesus came to him in a vision and told him, get out of Jerusalem quickly. Paul, get out. They are not going to accept your testimony about me. Paul is taken back and confused. He, he actually wants to argue with Jesus. Okay? In this vision, he argues with Jesus. says, but, 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 but they know me. They know how I used to beat and imprison all of those who believed in you, Jesus. They know how I stood by presiding over Stephen's death. None of this is how Paul envisioned ministry going. He dreamed of victories. And now he's being commanded by Jesus to flee the very city where he had spent the majority of his life, where he had built up a name for himself. Now he must flee. Wait a second. Jesus had already promised Paul that he would go before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Meanwhile, in verse 30, Paul is headed on a boat back to his hometown of Tarsus where he will spend the next seven to ten years. In the storyline of Acts, he is sent away. He does not know yet of his future adventures. And did you know that the only glimpse that we get of what happens during the seven to 10 year period of time in Paul's life is when you read the long list of persecutions in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that a substantial part of those persecutions happened while he was in Tarsus. That's all you get. Otherwise, it's completely unknown to us. What? is God doing? Now, as we step back from today's text, I want us to make two points of application that on the surface you're going to say are contradictory, but in reality, I'm stating the same reality, okay? Number one, guys, we have the luxury of looking at the whole of Paul's life. And not just the disappointments that he has in this current season. And because we know how the story ends, we know that God is faithful to his promise, isn't he? That, that Paul will stand before kings and governors and the Sanhedrin and the masses, both Jews and Gentiles, and even Caesar. And that God is going to use Paul for amazing kingdom advancement. That he will write much of the New Testament. And outside of Jesus, possibly the most influential person in all of human history. Then, then why would God take the babe Ruth of kingdom advancement and call him away to Arabia for two years? Why would he let him suffer humiliation and defeat? Why is his ministry in, in Tarsus relatively unknown for a decade outside of suffering? Because God's ways are not our ways. And frankly, God does not need anyone, including the Apostle Paul, to advance his kingdom. God is kind enough and gracious enough to use us in ministry. Not because he needs us, but rather because he delights in our participation. But guys, this time is actually preparation for future ministry. Developing his character in order to accomplish everything later. This I can tell you with confidence. God's chief priority in your life is to transform our character 
into the image of Jesus, even above ministry. Yeah, that's what Romans 8, 29 says directly. His chief aim in your life is to transform you into the image of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what God is doing in your life right now, that is what he is doing. He is working to this end, and guess what? He is not in a hurry. He is working from eternity. Moses, 40 years in the desert before God calls him to leave. Joseph, 13 years from being sold as a slave until he enters into Pharaoh's leadership. And even Jesus himself was 30 whenever he began ministry. And make no mistake about this because the author of Hebrews in chapter 5 points out that during those first 30 years, Jesus was learning obedience through the things that he suffered. Now, if Jesus needed to learn obedience and how to grow in faith through persevering suffering, not because he had sin. Okay? We have sin. He didn't have sin. If Jesus needed to go through that, how much more so do each one of us? Oh, how we dream of ministry and success in our lives like championship batter, banners that hang from the rafters, accomplishments and accolades, all good things. Hear me clearly. All of that is good. But the picture of God's aim in our life is more like a tireless shoe shine who isn't finished until he can see his own reflection staring back at him. You say, but his reflection will only increase if I decrease. See, the gospel isn't, it isn't only a one-time transaction. It's an infectious disease that growingly consumes every part of us. Oh, how quickly we forget that the gospel is a call to come and die, to deny ourselves and to take up his cross in order to follow. Die to self-dependence so that God-dependence can come in its place. But let's be honest, none of us turns over the reins easily. Some of us harder than others. And Paul is no different than you nor I. Yes, his life has been radically changed by encountering Jesus. But he has yet to learn the maturing truths of dependence upon Jesus and the futility of his own flesh. And Jesus, in kindness, is taking Paul through the school of hard knocks. Listen to this amazing quote by George Mueller. God delights to increase the faith of his children. We, instead of wanting no trials before victory, no exercise for patience, we ought to be willing to take them from God's hand as a means. I say, and I say it deliberately, trials, obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. But hear me, with Jesus, death is always followed by resurrection life. It's always followed by resurrection life. I had the impossible task of trying to, to go through Paul and, and, and to only give you one quote, right? One scripture quote where he unfolds this. And so, so as I say this, just imagine, know that he, he has written this decades later and imagine his journey so that he can grasp the depth of what he's saying, okay? He has lived this, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, some translation, jars of clay, and the whole point is they're fragile. 
so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. See, I couldn't just leave it to one quote. (laughs) Friends, take heart in your defeats and trials and discouragement. Because God is shaping you. And he can be trusted. And none of it is wasted in God's economy. You need to learn perseverance. So that your faith can be made strong and you be mature. In every trial that you go through, it may feel like the vessel is cracking But it is an opportunity for the gospel, for resurrected life to shine through so that you and I will say with Paul, not I, but Christ in me. All right, second point of application. And it may sound like I'm talking out of the other side of my mouth, but I'm telling you, this is the way that, that, that the gospel works out in our lives. Notice Paul's immediate obedience. Immediate obedience to tell the story and to pursue those that that God has placed in his life with the gospel. Verse 20, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. And when Paul is run out of Damascus, where does he go? Jerusalem. And what do we know? He has a passionate heart to go back and tell all those he formerly knew. And he argued with Jesus, but, 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 but they shouldn't listen to me. They know me. They have to hear from me. And where does he go after Jerusalem? Tarsus. Presumably to do the exact same thing, to plead with his friends and his family to any and to all who will listen that they need to know about the love of Jesus. So notice Paul did not have to be complete or fully formed in order to share the good news of Jesus. Guys, if that were the case, none of us would be here. Especially me. I wouldn't be standing here. Because did you know the guy that invited me and took me to the power team at First Baptist Carrollton, uh, his name was Matt Sutter. He came, to, uh, uh, he came to a soccer practice. He came up to me and he said, what are you doing tonight? I said, I don't know. He said, I'm picking you up at 5.30. We're going here. I said, where's here? He said, it doesn't matter. Just get in the car. We're going. <laughs> he got saved the night before. He got saved the night before. He wasn't fully formed. He was just excited because he had heard the good news of Jesus. And he would give me rides for the next year to Bible studies because I didn't have a car. He wasn't fully formed. He was just obedient. So listen to me. Who has God placed in your life right now for you to share Jesus with? When I was in college... After the Lord had grabbed a hold of me and I had experienced like six months of just an explosion of growth. Without going into the details, let me just share with you that the Lord deeply chastised me for not going back to witness to my friends from high school. And while I got the message, 
And I would spend a good portion over the next year reaching out to them, one by one, making contact and telling them how Jesus had changed me. Now, some of them cut off communication. They ran the other way. But a few of them came to know Jesus too. In fact, one of them, who was so wayward in high school, oh my goodness, I mean, he was a nutcase, now has his own ministry up in the Dallas area, serving uh, in our public schools, creating Bible, uh, after school Bible studies for, uh, for teenagers. And I've even had the honor and privilege of working with him, helping him develop some of that material. Praise God that Paul didn't have to be chastised like me, but rather he boldly pursued those from his former life. And every defeat he encountered proved to be on the job training for his later missionary journey. So as I wind down, there's something you need to hear me say with absolute clarity, that you have all the grace you need in order to be faithful right now. Paul didn't sit on the sideline and do nothing until he was mature enough to enter into ministry. I mean, so many in our churches, we sit and we soak and we will have attended 10 Bible studies over the past three years and not shared Jesus with two. Paul was moving, and God was steering. Paul responded with immediate obedience, shared his testimony, pursued the lost in his life, while God pruned and set the timing. You see, you have all the grace you need to be faithful right now. Church family, you should have received one of these as you walked in this morning. This is what we're calling our witness campaign as we move towards Easter. Our witness campaign. We've been combing through the book of Acts, right? And you shall be my witnesses. If you didn't grab one of these, you can get one at the connection tent afterwards. But this is what we're going to be doing as a church. And I pray that you will be willing to walk alongside us. Open it up to this first page and see right here this three, two, one. This three, two, one. Okay, over the course of the next 40 days, as we move towards Easter, would you be willing to pray for three lost people in your life? If you turn one more page, you can, uh, two more pages, sorry, you can see that we have a lost saved list where you just sit down, spend some moments. Remember the question, who has God placed in your life right now? Write them out. This entire book is a 30-day prayer guide where it actually has prayers already written out for you with blanks where all you do is insert the person's name that you're praying for, okay? So over the next 30 days, would you be willing to pray for three lost people? Put it in the hands of the Lord. Put it in the hands of the Lord that God would move and that God would stir. Two, three, two, one, the two is, would you be willing to share the gospel with two people? Would you challenge yourself From now until Easter, will you share the gospel with two people? And in order to help train and equip you to do that, on a Wednesday night coming up, we haven't set the date, but on a Wednesday night coming up in just a few short weeks, Chad is going to walk us through an entire gospel sharing training, okay? If this scares you, it's okay, but it's time to get equipped, and you can do it. God wants to use you, and he will use you. So will you share the gospel with two people? And then the one, that last one, the one is, would you have someone over to your house for dinner? Someone that you don't know where they are spiritually, one of the three, presumably, okay? A neighbor that you want to make contact with. Maybe 
maybe you don't know or maybe you do know and they're not connected to a church and you want to have them over for dinner, okay? In a couple weeks also, we're going to be rolling out a box that's going to have all the helps that you need, conversation starters and tools for, uh, for young people and teenagers, everything you're going to need. In fact, we're even including an HEB gift card in there. Okay, In a couple weeks, we're going to roll that out. All of this as we move towards Easter, because here's the incredible news, church. Did you know we live in a culture that is open to church and hearing about Jesus Christ at Easter and Christmas time? We still live in that culture. We must take advantage of it. We must press out. We had thousands of visitors on our campus at Bernie Bright. And on Easter, that will be the highest attended uh, that, that we have all year. Our highest attendance will be on Easter. So let's make sure that we are praying for, that we are reaching out, that we're doing what, what Paul did right here. He's being a witness. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news of Jesus. Thank you that you save us, that you save us And then that you allow us to participate in ministry. And we trust you with our whole lives that you, King Jesus, will even through the refiner's fire, through twists and turns in our lives, cause all of it to work together for good. We even invite you to prune us so that we can bear fruit for the glory of your name. That's a scary thing to say, Father, but we say it with open hands. And we pray as a church that you would help us to get over our fears and to be so intentional and to see who you have placed in our lives that we need to share the good news with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, as the praise team comes up here and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond. In fact, you are commanded to respond. If you've heard God's word, you must respond. You can do that in your seat. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you came in this morning and you saw Noah's baptism and you said, I haven't been baptized. You know what? I have never asked Jesus to be my king. Come. We would want nothing more than to share the good news of Jesus with you. Whatever God is doing, whatever he's calling you to, you be obedient.